Welcome everybody to the March session of our webinar series. My name is Brock Blevins and I'm here with Kara Nelson, co-leads of the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group. Today, we're gonna to have a wonderful presentation by Liette Vassar. She's the chair of the Ecosystem Governance Thematic Group of the CEM. And uh, just a couple of logistical notes here. Um, we meet once a month, third Friday of every month at this time. And uh, the objective of the webinar series is to uh, present to all of you relevant, exciting, technical topics all re uh, revolved around restoration. So we'll do about a 40, 45 minute presentation and we like to leave time at the end, at the end to uh, answer any questions that you might have. So if you have any questions throughout Liat's presentation, Feel, feel free to type them into the chat, uh, but we'll get to those at the end. So we hope to grow participation every month. If you miss any month, we will upload it to the Ecosystem Restoration uh, Thematic Group webpage, but we also post them uh, within a week on the YouTube playlist. So you can find all the previous sessions from last year and this year there. And if you're interested in the CEM membership, please contact Liette, myself, Kara, uh, and we can point you in the right, right direction. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass this off to Liette. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I, uh, oh, okay. uh, so thank you for inviting me to uh, be able to talk today. Uh, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, so, as we said, my name is Lia Basara. I'm at Brock University. Uh, Brock University is in the Niagara region in Ontario, Canada. Uh, I am also a UNESCO chair on community sustainability from local to global. And this means that I'm in the biology department, but I'm also in the faculty of social sciences in the environmental sustainability research center. I should say that uh, this is a co-production with my co-chair, uh, Thomas Zonkling. So uh, he um, is, uh, uh, I don't know if he's still in Vietnam or he's in Europe right now uh, with the COVID. I don't know what, where he is exactly. Um, so I want to put the uh, ecosystem governance and uh, restoration in the context of nature-based solutions in my case. Uh, we know that with all the environmental and climate changes happening, uh, we need to promote better resilience. And the resilience is on the ecosystem and society. So what we're looking is really the social ecological systems together. And um, it, we promote at the, the Commission on, e on Ecosystem Management, uh, conservation and restoration of biodiversity. And when we look at biodiversity, uh, we're looking at, uh, at it from the genetic to the landscape component. And it's really to make sure that we improve the capacity of communities and ecosystem to adapt to these changes and as well reducing disaster risks, because that uh, is something that we know now uh, are becoming more frequent in communities. Now, when we uh, look at ecosystem governance, and this is a definition that uh, uh, we have uh, adopted a few years ago uh, when we started the, uh, World, the World Forum on Ecosystem Governance, is that it's an inclusive approach to better connect the social system with the ecological system to improve conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem health. And this is for human well being. So, when we look at ecosystem governance, we're looking not only at government, but really at the community level. Uh, that will include the private sector, that will include um, NGOs, uh, civil society, everybody. So when we look at ecosystem governance, what we're looking at is really something that is eco-centered for humans' benefits, and especially in terms of well-being. 
So what we mean by that is that we are looking at the ecosystem and the health of the ecosystem through our human lens, if we want, but to make sure that the, there's a balance, that we can provide uh, the health of the ecosystem for human well-being. And this is important. This is a couple of slides that uh, we use at the first World Forum on Ecosystem Governance. And uh, this is just to show the, the importance of ecosystems and natural ecosystem and why do they need to be conserved and restored in many cases uh, is because it provide social, cultural, and economic stability. Stability in terms of food production, so food security, for example, but it may be stability in terms of enough uh, reducing or avoiding some conflicts between cultures or different uh, communities. So we want to make sure that these ecosystems are healthy to be able to do that. And also it's uh, having a re reliable access to nature services uh, is also very essential for economic development. And we know very well right now uh, that uh, if for any reason uh, we cannot produce food, it causes problems uh, in communities and uh, that brings new conflict, new stress for these communities. So we really need to make sure that the ecosystem is restored to be able to uh, bring uh, the, uh, the human population at a healthy level as well. So when we look at uh, ecosystem governance, one thing that it becomes very important for us is that it links conservation, restoration for sustainable development. So what it means is that if we look at the definition of sustainable development, which is development that mean, meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. That means that we have two concepts. The first concept is the one of needs. So the needs that we have uh, in terms of ecosystem services, that it's water, food, timber, etc., and the idea of limitations, because we have only one planet. So the technology, the social organization, all these components will limit the environment ability to meet the present and future needs. So we cannot right now destroy and degrade all of our land if we want to make sure that our future generation are going to be able to be healthy and meet their needs. So this is why it becomes very important to understand what ecosystem governance means in this context. One thing that uh, just came up uh, last week, and I think it's important to, uh, to underline that, and this is why ecosystem governance becomes more and more important, is that the UN report st stated that at least 105 of the 169 sustainable development goals targets will not be reached without local and regional governments. So this means that when we look at, the, uh, at conservation and restoration, we know that the local communities are very important in that. So we have to make sure that we promote what we call multi-level governance and partnership, and that all stakeholders can be involved. That means the private sector, civil society, uh, decision makers, et cetera. But we also need to make sure, and this is a very important point that is often missed uh, in the SDGs, is the integration with the ecological system. 
So we have to make sure that we have a healthy ecosystem first. If not, we cannot have very strong governance. So what are the prerequisites for ecosystem governance? Well, first of all, we know that we have national laws and policies. So what we have now to, to, to do is really devolve, so that means decentralize, at least up to a certain point, to the local level, to the local governments and communities to be able to self-rule. That means that the local governments has to uh, align their policies with the national framework, but also that the national policies should be reflecting the local practices and developments. So that means that there is a need for a better connection of what we call the top-down approach with the bottom-up. So that's very important. And the reason is so important is that efficient public participation is most effective at the local level. So if the local level is involved, it will help to bring to a higher level the idea that uh, there is a possibility to have a governance that is more suitable, socially acceptable for all, all the people in a country or a nation. The other prerequisite is that we need scientific knowledge and education. And this is very important when we devolve at the community level. So when we start having solution being dis discussed at a community level in a population, decision making, decision making has to happen but it cannot happen without having a certain level of knowledge. And it means that we have to make sure that the population is as access, first of all, to education, but also has access to the tools to make sure that they can understand what is happening. To be able to do that, it means that we need to look at interdisciplinary approach which means that we are not looking only at natural sciences. So if we are talking about restoring a large forest landscape, um, that we're not just looking at the natural, the ecology of the place, but also all the social sciences, because they play a crucial role. And this is important, especially when we work with uh, indigenous communities or different culture where traditional knowledge ecological traditional knowledge will be important for people to know how to work. So we need proper identification of all the social and ecological system components. It's not only natural sciences versus social sciences, they have to be integrated. It's not only pure science, but also the traditional knowledge that have also to be included. So it goes really beyond economic approach only. It's not a question of trying to figure out which timber is the most important for quick economic gain, but more what would be a better diverse system that may satisfy more than just a few people in the community. So to be able to do that, we have to have public engagement. So it's essential to include all stakeholders. The are key points to acknowledge when we look at that. First of all, is that ecosystems are complex and, and when we look at governance of ecosystem or ecosystem governance, it will be complex. The process will not be linear. We have to consider the footprint and the accountability during the decision making. We have to look at the possibility of scalability with flexibility and adaptability. So what it means is 
the system, the governance, and the decision making going with it should be able to change depending on new knowledge or new information, or probably considering people that we probably didn't engage with at the beginning. And for example, it may be that uh, the group started by having only male participant. When they, they have the female coming in, they realize that, oh, they're hard, they, they have some traditional knowledge about this for us that are important to integrate. So we have to make sure that it brings the engagement. Uh, it brings also the trust building so that everybody can trust each other in terms of getting uh, the information, but also for the decision making. So my experience with such an approach is that it requires quite a lot of time and some space, ethical space for people to have the right to talk about it. It brings transparency, so everybody has to bring at the table the data or the information they have. And in many cases, it brings transformation for these communities because it means that people have to talk together. They have to be able to decide, make a decision in a way that it will benefit everybody. Other principles uh, include, for example, that it has to be context specific. Again, as we said, um, it, the local comp component is important to understand, and it has to uh, really bring the, uh, the information from the local level, so the bottom up, which will at one point have to meet the top down. But if we don't have the bottom up first to, to, to understand what's happening, it's difficult to see uh, how just arriving from somewhere, somewhere else, we may be able to do uh, some action. So there are some implications in terms of capacity building. As I said before, education and formation is important, but also for the policy development. And one thing that I want to underline again is the respects of cultural practices and livelihood. This is important. Uh, here in Canada, we have to work quite a lot with that with our indigenous people and uh, to make sure that we reconcile uh, what we have done bad in the past, including the, the degradation of many of their lands. So uh, this is a very good diagram that uh, Thomas has put together that try to explain a little bit the top-down bottom-up approach that have to get into together. So here it's a system where nobody talks to each other. But gradually what we want is that people start talking. So from the community to the government through institutions and that these institutions work with the civil society, the NGOs, the private sector, and that everybody can communicate and receive information or give information to be able to have a better idea of what's happening. But the last step is in fact in making sure that we understand the environment as well. So that by the end, what we do is having a good understanding of the social, ecological system, S-E-S. -E so understanding the complete picture of what's happening so that when we start action like restoration, people know that they are protecting cultural aspects, they are protecting biodiversity, but they are practicing, uh, protecting livelihoods, for example. And by, by the end, what we hope through ecosystem governance is that we have a better policy alignment between what is needed at the local level and what's happening at the national level. 
Now, there are uh, different ways and different actions that can be done to get to that. Uh, as I said first, capacity building at all levels. So everybody has to be able to receive the information, understand the issue, and bring their own information that they have. There's a, there is a need for appreciation of the importance of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of people, when we work with communities, do not understand that, do not understand the importance of communities, of uh, ecosystem services, sorry. And uh, there has to be a recognition of the role of local communities. And that's sometimes difficult for some governments or some uh, sub governments in some cases. And that is something that has to be understood because as we said, we know that we cannot achieve a lot of these goals without having people at the local level. So it takes time, it takes time to build capacity to have this appreciation and this recognition. <clears throat> so actions are needed, uh, but as this little cartoon put it, uh, in complex systems, cause and effects are often distant in time and space. So this means that we cannot expect that within only one or two meetings, all the community will be on board. You need to take the time to know where they are at and how they want to be involved. <coughs> Excuse me. So in summary of these uh, prerequisite and, and component, what we can say is that institutions uh, and adaptive, adaptive ecosystem governance have to be connected the bottom-up and community involvement is needed for le legitimacy. The stakeholder participation is crucial, and that means everyone. Uh, interestingly enough, sometimes uh, elderly groups or youth are not considered, but they may be as important. People focus uh, and livelihood security has to be part of it and making sure that the ecosystem services benefits are there. And these are used. So use one are like food, water, but also non-use. So it may be for meditation, recreation, etc. I just want to give a couple of example that uh, gives a, a bit of an idea of how this can work in practice. And this is uh, in Comanda in Ecuador, uh, where we, uh, we were working, visiting. Um, and this is a man who decided that he didn't want to have his plantation being just laurel or oranges or none, because he was doing that before. He was by himself. And what happened is it was only himself working on it, uh, the eight, 10 years that needed to grow the NEM, for example, uh, and there was no biodiversity. So he decided to restore his land, which is a large uh, territory, by involving others as well, and decided to increased biodiversity. So what he did is he planted plants that are nat natted from the region, um, some being useful, like uh, Nem Laurel, uh, trees that, are, that he can use for uh, different work, but also adding some other plants that give either uh, fruits, or different other component that he can use for selling in the market. So in his case, 
different things happen. First, the birds came back, and you can see a nest here. But he started to uh, decide to use only uh, the wood that he needs. So if he needs a bit some wood for a door, he will go cut a tree. But now he has a nursery. And I say he, but in fact, it's, uh, he is employing several people now. Uh, so it's a community um, work that's happening where the nursery provides the tree that has been cut. So they cut only and replace the tree automatically. And finally, he has several other uh, components, like for example, uh, cacao and uh, other fruits that he can sell to the market. So from being the only person there, he now has over a dozen people from the community working together and they provide different resources. So that's uh, a way um, that helps to uh, bring a different level through ecosystem governance and restoration uh, to a community that now has uh, a lot more uh, diverse economy and capacity to survive at different times. The other example that I want to talk about is Wapishka. Wapishka is in northern Quebec in Canada. Uh, it's called the Manitouaga Wapishka region. Um, what is happening is uh, you have, and I should say it's a biosphere reserve. So um, the, uh, the, uh, the two men together, the one on the left uh, is the director of the Biosphere Reserve of Manikwaga Wapishka. The other young uh, man with the, the little uh, hat is a new indigenous guardian. What is interesting with uh, this biosphere reserve is that the, um, the director worked with the town of Bekomo and the community, the indigenous community of Pesemit. This is an Inuit community. And together worked on trying to make sure that there was a good protection of the uh, Wapishka territory. So this is a reserve, so it's a conservation area that needed a little bit some restoration, but also needed um, a better protection. In Canada, the indigenous communities uh, wrote what they called, uh, it's a, you can find it online, a report called Together We Rise. And this is a response of the indigenous communities to what we call the target 11 in Canada, which is the target, the edgy target one of protection and increased protection to 17%. What happened is the Wapishka station, instead of being, uh, and the reserve, instead of being uh, managed by a government or other people, it was decided that the uh, Pesemit young indigenous guardians were going to be formed, trained, and gradually be able to be the one helping to manage the, sta the station. So the station is in fact managed by the indigenous people of the region, by Pesemit. So it demonstrates the possibility to link ecosystem protection, restoration, and ecosystem governance through uh, also bring the cultural aspects and the indigenous people to help and work together. So this is, a, I think, a very good example of how ecosystem governance with uh, you know, Canadian indigenous people in the same region at the local level can work together. So there are many tools uh, that exist, uh, and I just want to show a little bit some of them that um, uh, in many cases I'm using them myself, uh, that are, can be uh, useful 
to know for uh, when we talk about ecosystem governance. First, uh, to make sure that we ensure that uh, we have no one left behind is to ensure that the, the public engagement is there and that there's the, the planning and the decision making is open to everybody. So everybody can be invited. That means the respects of cultures. And as I showed in the example of Manikwagan Wapishka, that was very important, as well as a respect for the natural ecosystem, especially when we talk at, uh, at the level of restoration, uh, having a monoculture plantation versus a diverse forest may have a big difference at the end for the population. There are different other uh, sources of uh, information, very useful. And this is one that I often like to remember people that um, when we look at public participation, there's different type, uh, there's a, there are different types of uh, system. Many will stay only at the information or consultation level. But these are what I call the uh, low level, the easy to grab, because we just inform people. If we want really to go towards ecosystem governance, we have to start not only involving, but more collaborating and empowering the community. So that this is why it takes more time because you have to at that point really get people involved. So this is why empowerment where at that point the decision uh, is also made with the public uh, is often more powerful. And the reason is because you have an increase in um, so, well, an increase in social acceptability, which usually increase the possibility of a sustainable solution. And that's also very important. In my case, I work right now on uh, ecosystem-based adaptation uh, in the town of Lincoln, which is uh, not too far from where I live. And uh, what we decided is to start with community profile to understand the community uh, in all aspects, economic, social, cultural, ecological. And then we look at different questions. Where do we start? What are the issues? What are the, uh, the more, most vulnerable parts of the ecosystem? And we did that first through semi-structure interviews but then more community engagement. So until we got locked out because of the COVID, we were doing public meetings and focus groups. Uh, and we are using the process of what we call the theory of change to make sure that we can capture all the information very well. Another tools that we have been using is what we call social network analysis. In our case, we're using uh, Gephi. Gephi is one software. There are many of them. The reason we have selected Gephi uh, is that uh, when we did an analysis of the different system, this one was the most flexible and easier to learn at the community level. The other advantage is that it is compatible with people on PC versus people on Mac. And it is also a system that uh, is in different languages. I believe it's over 20 different languages. It is important for Canada since we have, uh, it's a bilingual country. So what it helps having a social network analysis is that we make sure that no one is left behind. We need to know who are the actors, what are the links, the ties between them. Know also if there are possible conflict because that is also a possibility. And it helps to co-construct 
uh, together when we look at solution. It helps also in the social learning. So who can help each other uh, and experience sharing. So each actor has a different experience related to a certain issue. What we have discovered doing that with a previous project in uh, coastal communities uh, is that it brought also new social innovation. Because local communities may have solutions that as experts, we don't necessarily know. So it brings also the possibility to look at more sustainable views of what's happening. And that's also important. So by the end, when we look at ecosystem governance and nature-based solution, we know now more and more, and I think the different crises that we have recently demonstrate that it's not optional, but essential to ensure continued access to vital ecosystem services and for human well-being. So what it means is that if we have the involvement of the local level, we know that we can certainly go a lot further, uh, especially in terms of social acceptability, but also for the sustainable uh, maintenance of what's happening. So this is in a very broad view, what I wanted to talk about with ecosystem governance. Uh, this is a uh, subject that uh, is taking now more and more interest uh, everywhere, I should say. <laughs> Um, I've had some connection recently uh, and emails um, that a few projects are starting across the world to better understand how to use ecosystem governance uh, as a basis to uh, bring population to work together on issues that it's uh, conservation or restoration, ecosystem-based adaptation, uh, nature-based solution, etc. So thank you very much, and uh, I think I will be ready for either comments or a uh, question. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liat, for your excellent presentation. This is Kara Nelson, and I am monitoring the chat. So far, we've had a lot of great introductions from participants, and we have a large crew on board here. We have too many people to have folks unmute themselves, but take a minute and think of your questions for Liette and put them in the chat. And as those questions are coming in, I want to talk about an opportunity for the World Conservation Congress. As of now, the Congress is still uh, planning to go ahead in June, but I think given the global situation, there's a high likelihood that it will be postponed. However, given that it will be postponed, any planning that we do in advance will still pay off. At the Congress in the exhibition hall, there will be a pavilion on ecosystem restoration. And there's many exciting ways that the restoration community can participate including having an opportunity to present your restoration work, be it research at a university with an NGO or in the private sector. So if you are planning, if you were planning to go to the Congress in June and are likely, if it gets postponed, to plan to go to the postponed date, please um, contact either myself or Brock and let me know about your interest in participation in the Ecosystem Restoration Pavilion. Okay, and I see some questions. Here's the first one for, from Lorenzo, uh, which says, how to make ecosystem governance more appealing, more appealing to reluctant policymakers, those who think that preservation is money down the drain? Is there an effective way to give a value to ecosystem services? And are there downsides in using a price-based approach? Well, it's interesting because um, I should say uh, one of my previous um, previous project in Quebec, um, we thought first that everybody was going to 
look mostly at the economy and look at the finance and everything else. When we started having the discussion around the table, by the end, the element that was uh, not necessarily the first uh, is economy. Economy was, in fact, the third component. The first one was the health of people. And the second was the uh, avoidance of contamination. These were the first, so environmental and health, human health, then economy was third in terms of the decision. And the reason is that if people understand all the components of the social ecological system, they better understand what are the important part. An economy that suddenly does not count as much. I know politicians and uh, big government and the neoliberal system always believe that uh, the God is, uh, is money, but it's not when you work with communities. Great, thank you. Um, here are two questions that were sent privately through the chat linked together. I'd like more specifics on the theory of change Liette mentioned, and then unpack the word governance, given current situation with some authoritarian governance systems. Yeah, the, uh, well, the theory of change is the, um, it's a way to do monitoring and evaluation of projects. Uh, and what it is, is that before we were using the uh, logic model, or the results-based management where we had activities, output, outcome, and impact. With the theory of change, we, it's more fluid. So that means that people are discussing together what they see as a vision, and they discuss the options. So it's more adaptive and can change more rapidly than if you look at the um, the uh, usual logic that, uh, oh, you have to have this to get to that. So it's a bit different at this level. In terms of governance, uh, it's interesting because uh, people always think that uh, if you have an, a, 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 a very uh, authoritative system, that governance cannot happen at the community level. My experience uh, working in China uh, has been that, in fact, they uh, adopted it very quickly. And the reason is they know that communities have a big power to implement things and do things, but they also want to understand um, what they have and how they can probably do better. So, interestingly enough, uh, it's um, it's, it's not necessarily governance, it's really when people get together. It's the institutions, it's, uh, are the, uh, the different people, the different interactions that bring people together. And um, it can be quite powerful. Uh, I've been very surprised uh, in my experience with different countries, how that can really help people. Great. Let's see if I can scroll here. Um, this is from Michael Rogers. Thank you for the presentation. I've been thinking about how to monitor the adequacy of different levels of public engagement. How do we ensure the level of public engagement is appropriate for a given project? Do we simply measure presence absence, compare engagement to comparable projects, et cetera? The way that we monitor public engagement in our case is um, in part, yeah, if you have people coming or not, but also uh, I should say that in the Lincoln case, when we did the interviews, one thing that came up very quickly is that people wanted to have more information about what, what is climate change, what is adaptation, all these kind of things. But they said the problem right now is all the information is too difficult to understand. And so what we did is decided to have a weekly 
blog post. In fact, it's on my website, but we ask all the local newspapers if they want to, to have to post these uh, blogs. So they are doing that since August last year. Every single week, we have a blog that is published by all the local newspaper around here to help understand uh, what's happening. The interesting part is that we have more and more people engaged, but also people have been contacting us after reading these blogs to get more involved. So we have to remember the power of social media, but also traditional newspaper to bring people together. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, in our case, I should say, we also have the, uh, the town of Lincoln that is also interacting with us on a very regular basis. So we try to all e help each other. Great, thank you. We have our next question from Miria Stolt. She says, this may be too detailed, but how do you address power imbalances when you do your community consultations, for example, between elders and the younger generation or men and women, to ensure that everyone is involved and able to voice their options? Yeah, sometimes you need to uh, take different approach. <laughs> uh, if I look at uh, a project that I, had, that I was part of in uh, Burkina Faso uh, in Africa, um, what helped me a lot as a woman uh, at one point was to work with the um, Association of uh, Mothers uh, for Education. So these are all the mothers who have kids in the school. And through them, I was able to better understand uh, issues related to food security for the kids in the canteen and the school. And one thing that I well, define it took my hand at one point and brought me directly to their uh, garden, their school garden, to discover that it was so degraded and uh, polluted because they were told to always add more power, powder, powder uh, of pesticide and powder of fertilizer on their plants, that they had contaminated the water, they had contaminated the soil. Uh, most of their vegetables were not growing because they were probably at the toxic level. So we worked together to change their approach, their system uh, through biodiversification. So that means increasing the diversity and not in monoculture, but in small little uh, plots. And it really helped to restore the full system uh, to the point that they had enough for uh, the canteen and even more. So sometimes we have to take different approach. Uh, and uh, it's really depending where we are. Our next question is from Gil in Portugal. And he says, considering the implementation of private nature conservation areas promoted and owned by nonprofit NGOs with a local community-based structure, what would be the main challenges that you could identify even comparing to worldwide existing examples? And these areas are constituted on the basic of the intrinsic value of nature, so not about nature services to people, thanks. We will always have some uh, specific, even uh, I should say they don't need to be private. We have some public uh, uh, protected areas uh, managed by government that are not necessarily accessible to people. Um, I think what is important is, are these regions, are these places um, really protecting, first of all? And uh, second, um, is there a need for uh, people to go there or not. Um, so that's a question that is very difficult to answer. Uh, I, I'm aware, have been visiting some of these private uh, conservation area in different countries. Um, and in many cases, they are in a way that uh, no 
there's not really a lot of activities around. Um, so the community is part of it, but doesn't need to go there. So it's really depending. Um, I think if a private um, sector uh, is thinking about buying or taking over a certain place, uh, it may be a good question of saying, are they going to connect with the community first to know if the community is accepting, accepting that, or if there are already traditional um, activities are happening there uh, that they may probably at that point limit. Okay, thank you. We have a comment from Patrick Jasper related to the, the gender issue. And he says, in India, gender is an issue. Empowerment of women, especially in such ecosystem-based projects is very difficult even when we plan for it, since all leadership positions are held by men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is why uh, in Burkina Faso is the same. In fact, uh, the, uh, what I've learned very quickly is that uh, the man owns the woman. So uh, it's very, uh, very hierarchical like that. And this is why by working with the woman, we understood what were the issues. And, uh, but it's really woman to woman. And it's often the way uh, I've, I had some colleague trying as uh, a man to work with the woman and it didn't necessarily work uh, in part because I think it's a gender issue that we still have to deal with. Now, um, back to ecosystem services, we have a comment from Mohammed Talib, and he says, thank you a lot for this interesting presentation. I think instead of talking about ecosystem services, it's better to talk about nature contribution to people, which mm -hmm. is a global concept that also includes ecosystem services. Yeah, I agree. In fact, uh, I should have mentioned that also because uh, uh, in uh, for the biosphere reserve uh, with a colleague of mine and we wrote a uh, a uh, guide a manual for uh, assessing what we call ecosystem services and uh, we have changed the word ecosystem services for uh, na nature contributions to people uh, and uh, in fact we have a table in which we are showing uh, that each uh, of the 18 uh, nature contribution to people can be connected to at least one uh, SDGs, one sustainable development goal. So yeah, I agree completely with that. <laughs> okay, now we're going back to um, this issue of engaging women and Consuelo Bonfil is responding to Patrick's comment and she says, is it possible to start by calling women and ask their opinion to begin with? Would men mm -hmm. listen to them if you articulate their opinions? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, this is why having, uh, having them on board very, very early uh, is certainly uh, very helpful. Okay, we have one final question, comment, which is, there, this is by Arlene Hopkins, she says, there has been much argumentation on theory of change, theory and practice. Do we have an empirical basis for most effective theory of change best practices? For example, I've spent 10 years having pleasant arguments with colleagues trying to understand this question. Yeah, this is why I keep, uh, the way that I put the, the theory of change, first of all, uh, um, Usually I try to make sure that people understand the basis, but I try to make sure that it remains flexible. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, yeah, you, I've seen some, uh, <laughs> some papers and some, uh, some projects working on the theory of change and making it so strict that by the end, uh, it's probably worse than the uh, results-based management system. So yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, this is why I usually try to build a lot of that with the community directly instead of trying to think about it as a um, scientific or strict question. Great, thank you. Let's see, I have come to the end of questions and we're just about 
out of time. If anyone has any uh, short last question, I'll be able to see it in the chat. In the meantime, I am right now sending a survey for you to provide feedback on this webinar. I just sent that through the chat. In addition, Brock uploaded a link where you can get information on the Society for Ecological Restorations webinar series. They have recently added, in addition to their monthly series, a new Wednesday webinar opportunity. Since many of us are staying at home and working at home, webinars can be a good way to connect and still uh, stay engaged with the community. The next webinar in our series will be April 17th, and Willem Ferwerda, who's the CEO and founder of Common Land, will be speaking about innovative finance for restoration, which percolated to the top from our webinar participants last year in terms of interest for adding into our series. So I hope many of you can join us next month. Please take the survey and let us know your feedback on the webinar series and upload your ideas. I also, in the chat window, provided information on the Congress that I was speaking about, and apologies for not providing all the details when I mentioned it. That's the IUCN World Conservation Congress which is scheduled to take place in June. It's an every four year event for IUCN and the Commission on Ecosystem Management. Uh, Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, uh, who is the host for this webinar series, is actively engaging in content for restoration at the Congress. So please contact either myself or Brock if you're interested in learning more. So, a quick scan of the chat. Um, people are saying thanks for a great webinar. Thanks for your insight. And I'll just end with echoing those thoughts. Liette, thank you so much for all the work you're doing on ecosystem governance and with CEM. And we really appreciate your taking the time to share that work with us here today. No problem. And if people are interested, we have a survey also that you can find on the uh, CEM uh, ecosystem governance webpage. Uh, it's, look, it, it's called special uh, newsletter. And you can uh, at that point see the, uh, the, uh, the, the survey and uh, we'll certainly appreciate because we're still working a little bit more on the, not only the definition, but gradually the principles. So I'm gonna right now um, pull up that survey link and for those of you who are interested, stay uh, connected for a minute and I'll put the link in the chat box. I'll Thank just you take very much. a minute to do so. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you everyone. We really appreciate your joining and we hope we will see you next month. Great, thank you. Thank you, Liat. Bye no everybody. Problem. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye.